as I was saying, welcome to Agenda 225, the uh, flagship conference of the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity. It's great to be with you today. We've got an incredible panel of all-star uh, thinkers and historians uh, and philosophers, even uh, uh, and journalists about this very important topic, which is we've had this political realignment during the Trump years. Trump is most likely not gonna be president starting in January, 2021. But what does Trump's uh, presidency and the aftermath of Trump's presidency mean for what the conservative and progressive Republican and Democratic coalitions, what should those coalitions be? What will they be? I'm gonna to argue today uh, that we should build a new, a new liberal movement out of what was the conservative movement of the late 20th century and early 21st century and incorporating some elements of the, the Democratic coalition as well. Um, and, but before we do that, I wanna tell you about who's joining us today. David Frum, who's at the Atlantic and uh, is the author of Dead Right and many other books about the history of uh, American political movements will we'll lead us off. He'll introduce the topic. Then I will speak and give a, a bit kind of a slide presentation about my argument about a new liberal movement. Uh, and then Rich Lowry and Yasha Munk and Steve Tellis. Uh, Rich is the editor of National Review, the flagship uh, 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 magazine of the conservative movement founded by Bill Buckley in 1955, if I'm recalling the year correctly. Yasha Munk is the founder of Persuasion, which is an incredible new newsletter, which you absolutely should subscribe to, uh, uh, where he has assembled uh, an incredible eminent list of, of people who believe in uh, freedom of inquiry from a philosophical liberal point of view, as he would put it. And we're also gonna be joined by Steve Tellis of the Niskanen Center and Johns Hopkins, who's a political scientist who wrote an extremely interesting article in National Affairs about this very topic, about how uh, liberals, small L classical liberals in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party should work together uh, within their coalitions. So with that, David, let me, uh, let me let you start. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Well, um, thank you. Thank you for this uh, welcome. Thanks to all who participate. Such a, a busy day, such a nerve wracking time. Um, we, this is one of um, the legacies of the Trump era. We are living through an era of mass mobilization in politics and mass participation in politics. You could call it do, what we saw in 2018 and again in 20 was dueling mobilizations. Um, that in, in both these two elections, um, even the losing side, the Republican side, did a mobilization that is crushing, stunning by the um, records of anything in the in in really the post since uh, the coming of the of the vote for uh, people who are 18 to 21, um, and the Democrats did even bigger. Um, this is an era of mass participation too. Social media and social media fundraising have enabled a lot of people to uh, engage in politics as a personal activity. For some, it's a substitute for religion. For others, it's a substitute for sports. Um, but people are engaged on a scale um, that is just astonishing to see. Maybe this will change in the coming, uh, in, in a different administration. Maybe it's here to say, I'm not here to predict that. But what I, I wanna issue this caution. Um, we can talk, when we think about big coalitions and how coalitions can be remade, when you're dealing in an era of mass participation, you're dealing with um, building blocks that are extraordinarily large and heavy, and they can't be reassembled as you will. So for people who are engaged in the ideas business, I think it's useful, most useful to focus on the things you can do in the places where you can see results, not what a new coalition would look like, but what would a new set of ideas look like? And I wanna draw on history here for the two most successful such attempts um, in the past century and more. Um, and one is the progressive movement of the 1910s and the other is the conservative movement of the 1970s. Both of these were comparatively small movements involving um, at, um, in, in their most active phase, in the uh, few hundred, few thousand people. So the ones we remember tend to be the ones who published, but many of them were, were um, activists and community people. They're not, they, they didn't all leave behind a written record. But they, and, uh, but they were people who um, cohered around a bunch of group, sets of ideas um, that they then introduced into the political system. And the most important thing for present purposes about these two sets of ideas is they cut at a diagonal to the existing party system. Um, the progressive ideas resonated both in the Democratic and the Republican parties. There was competition in both parties and there was rejection in both parties. And both parties had reason to dislike elements of the progressive movement. Uh, both parties had reason to accept. 
And the same thing was true with the conservative movement of the 1970s. Um, many of the most important deregulate, one of the most powerful and successful achievements of that conservative movement was the deregulation uh, effort of the 1970s. And many of the most important elements of the deregulation movement were done by democratic state and federal governments. It was J Jimmy Carter, not Ronald Reagan, was the great deregulator in American history. Um, uh, if you are thinking about what can you as, do as a writer and a thinker to contribute to a, a better country and a better world, I, I think your energies are focused on thinking about the progressive and conservative movements rather than such things as the New Deal and Nixon realignments. One is within your power and the other is beyond your power. So what, what would a new liberal, to borrow uh, the term of the day, what would, it, what would some of the elements be? Things that are, are at variance between uh, the, the, two, the two parties. Um, one, and I, I have a few suggestions about things that, that um, might be on the agenda. The first is um, a culture of tolerance and respect. Um, it has uh, never been easier for people to express themselves than today, not only in terms of the law, but in terms of the technology. Um, with this extraordinary increase in the communicative power of the average person um, has gone also an extraordinary entrance in, in, uh, increase in um, the ability of, of others to hear and to react and to exact consequences. Now, any important activity has consequences attached to it and speech and writing should, um, so long as we're now we're talking in the realm of society, not the state, they can't be consequence free. But the question is, are, are, is our attitude uh, toward, uh, toward speech and expression easygoing, forbearing, um, willing to learn, or is it censorious and punitive? Um, and I think one of the things that probably unites all the people in this conversation is the sense that without drawing hard and fast rules, because that's impossible, um, but just to have a sense of how do we encourage people to have a more easygoing under, uh, approach to the mistakes and uh, errors of others. Um, that with, with this device, uh, we have put the power of career and personal and social suicide into the hands of hundreds of millions of people in an instant. Um, and given that they have that power and that some of them will unfortunately exercise it, maybe they need a society around them that is more forgiving of, uh, of the inevitable mistakes. A second the uh, theme of, it would seem to me, of, an, of a new movement is, um, is uh, that, and that one, again, that comes to, variance of the parties is to reaffirm the centrality of free trade. This is the idea that actually created the original liberal cause. Um, uh, along, along, um, or was one of the, the core ideas that created the original. And, and it's in, it is in trouble uh, today. Um, of course, President Trump has uh, been the most protectionist president since the post-war era. Uh, but you can see strong protectionist tendencies in the Democratic Party. And you can actually, it's a, the career of Joe Biden gives you a fascinating um, proof of, or timeline for the shift. Joe Biden, as we all have heard, has, was in the Senate for a very long time. From the beginning of his career until 2004, he voted, I believe, for every single trade agreement, every single expansion of presidential trade authority put before him. Um, he voted for NAFTA, he voted for the US Canada Free Trade Agreement, he voted for the ex, uh, creation of the World Trade Organization. From 2004 onward, he never voted for one again. And there were many of them presented in the second Bush term. But you can just see the moment. He just he was voting for all before and for none after. And it's not like the agreements after 2004 were all terrible and those before 2004 were all perfect. Um, he changed, not the agreements. Um, and you can see it, it, you can see in his in that his town hall that he talks so much about by American as an important tool of policy for his administration. And he plans on extending that from its traditional um, realm in the area of defense purchasing to other areas too. So a movement that stood up for free trade, not as um, something that, that is one always called for in every single case without regard to circumstances, but as an idea, as a principle, as something that has benefits not only for Americans, but for the world. And, that, and to say that the interests of people outside the United States should also count. And that we want to build the structure of a peaceful world and that free, free and open trade is essential to securing global peace. That is something that I think the world is going to need to hear a, a lot from. Um, I think one of the... Uh, one of the um, things that is going to be especially urgent um, in the next year uh, is to understand the inherently um, imperfect nature of politics and the need for trade-offs. We have seen this in the debate on COVID. And one of the, again, many unfortunate things about the Trump administration 
Uh, but we've had a debate of, of, of COVID over the past year that has gone like this. On the one hand, our public health professionals who are determined to save every single, not only save every life, but to avoid every instance of sickness, regardless of cost. And the other are screaming and paranoid lunatics who reject scientific expertise entirely. Now, faced with that choice, uh, of course, the, you listen to the public health experts because the other people are not even not even worth listening to, never mind weighing the arguments. And most of, so much of what they say was, was conscious lying, hydroxychloroquine. But once you move out of the Trump era, all politics has trade-offs. I mean, if someone came to you and said, look, I have a plan for a bridge um, and for a certain budget, I can guarantee the bridge will last for a hundred years. And if you double the budget, I can guarantee the bridge will last for a thousand years. And if you double the budget again, I can guarantee that the bridge will last for 10,000 years. At some point you said, I, I don't need a 10,000 year bridge. And I'm not even sure I really need a thousand year bridge. A hundred will do me, thank you very much. Um, the costs of the, of the approach to this epidemic we've taken are, go beyond the economic to their impact on the education of a generation of school children. We will 50, 60, 70 years from now, see the impress of COVID on the life chances of children who, who were put at educational risk by the approach we took. That has to weigh too. And acceptance of rational decision-making, of uh, trade-offs, of imperfections, of costs, um, and that it's, you're not a bad person if you say that, some uh, that you are going to weigh some benefits against other costs, that that doesn't make you negligent. That, that is a, a, um, a, an approach to thinking that needs to, be, uh, that needs to be justified is actually humane and the educational chances of the children are, uh, are part of that. And I, I think one, uh, one other issue that I would address in this short period of time um, is we need to, to rediscover the importance of sound public finance. Um, and this, is, uh, this is, should be a cross party idea. Um, the first socialist Canadian, you asked me to, uh, I've talked about something about Canada. Tommy Douglas, who's this legendary Canadian um, figure, the premier of Saskatchewan in the 1940s, the founder of socialized medicine in Canada, um, he famously balanced his books every year because he said, nothing is more dangerous to social reform than unsound public finance. Um, and we have lived for a dozen years in an era where borrowing has been essentially costless. Um, and it's understandable why governments have incurred enormous deficits. And, and we have had two, in the past space of 12 years, worse since the Great Depression, economic shocks. So spend whatever money it takes to avoid a depression. That, that makes sense. Because one of the things we learned from the Great Depression is however expensive you think the depression is, failing to deal with it leads to wars, and wars are more expensive than that. Um, so Right, borrow crazily in 2009 and spend the money. Right, borrow crazily in 2020 and spend the money. But what is the excuse for the unsound finances that we had from in 2017, 2018, 2019? Pre-COVID, the United States was on its way to trillion dollar deficits forever. Um, and uh, post-COVID, uh, we are going to hear voices that say, um, we don't wanna engage in the politics of the allocation of um, sacrifice that are are necessary in order to put the public finances on a sound public footing. Someone has, stand, has to stand up and say, the days of free money will not last forever. In the phrase of Herbert Stein, the great economist, if something cannot continue forever, it will stop. Um, and whatever, when we think about the future of our societies and social choices we are making, we have to ask, what does this look like if, federal, if the cost of borrowing for the federal government goes to... For, from the present near zero to two points, to three points, to four points. What happens then? Um, right now, the cost of interest is, a, is highly bearable because the rate is so low, it will not stay low like this. So those themes, cultural tolerance, uh, the importance of free trade, the importance of scientific expertise and the important and trade-offs, and finally, the, the continuing value of sound public finance. Uh, those are things that policy intellectuals um, can take on board as, as causes that do not get nearly enough attention right now that are essential to and that can form the, co the beginning of a new kind of, of um, intellectual movement that is then a resource to the two competing parties and their competing mass mobilizations. One of the things, and I'll say one, I, I wanna keep this within the time and be respectful of that, but one thing that has really been a change in Washington DC uh, over my time here is the way that the think tank community which once saw itself as, as 
providing a service to politicians of any point of view. Um, and the, the, uh, the job here was to set up an inventory of, of scalable ideas that are borrowable ideas. And that is actually that your biggest success came when the idea from a, th from a conservative think tank was appropriated by a liberal politician or from a liberal think tank was appropriated by, that was the definition of success. The, the, the think tanks have tended to become as partisan as all the rest of American society. And that destroys their value. Because first, they don't think freely because they become, they, they become, they begin to think, how does this, um, how uh, will this, how does this poll, will this be popular, which is not their job, and they, they're not good at it. And then they, and then second, that they begin to limit their own free range, because they, there are all these veto points, we can't say this, because we know that the politicians in quote unquote, our party won't like it. To, to break free from those partisan constraints, to take seriously what it means to have a 501c3 status, that um, you are a charity, you are not a par uh, party activity is not tax deductible in the United States, only educational activity is, to take that seriously and to say, the test of my success will be how broadly how, uh, how many people find what I have to say of interest, um, how many people are willing to uh, implement this, and how you can even perhaps get these two mass mobilization entities, the great parties, to compete a little bit, to borrow the ideas that your intellectual work advances. Great. With that, thanks, David. With that, uh, let me offer some thoughts of my own. And fully acknowledging that what I'm arguing for, a new liberal coalition, is is hard to do. It's hard to move these pieces around. There's a certain uh, inertia to them that uh, that we have to respect. Uh, but given that, I'm going to argue that uh, there's a necessity to to reevaluating the political coalitions that we have. So I'm going to share my screen here and walk you through some slides, because uh, uh, as, a, as a wonky guy, I think tank guy, that's, I guess, the way I, I like to talk. I'm, I'm going to start here by talking about my dad. My dad uh, came to America from India in 1961 at a time when only 100 people from the country of India were allowed into the United States because of the immigration laws uh, that were extant at that time. But my dad uh, really, really became a passionate uh, passionately fond of America. I'll, I'll never forget the day when I was uh, seven years old and we were, they, he was jumping up and down on his couch like a teenager when the U.S. beat the Soviet Union in the 1980 Winter Olympics and he'd never seen a hockey game before in his life. His uh, favorite president was Kennedy. His second favorite president was Reagan. And Reagan, in his last speech uh, as president of the United States, said something that really has always stuck with me. He said, he, he was uh, reading off the letter that uh, uh, an American had sent him. And it said, you can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to live in Germany, Turkey, or Japan, but, but you cannot become a German, a Turk, or Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to live in America and become an American. This was the idea that has always made America exceptional. But is it still? There's skepticism on the left they say there are people on the left who say your, your race, your identity determines everything about your life. It's not something you can transcend. America will not welcome you for being different. And there are people on the right that say if your parents or your grandparents were born somewhere else, you don't deserve to be an equal partner uh, in the American project. But before we talk about uh, the current day, I want to go back to 1964. 1964 was uh, the race, the presidential race between Lyndon Johnson and Barry Goldwater. Uh, the Barry Goldwater candidacy was, uh, was a triumph of the conservative movement built by Bill Buckley and others. They saw Goldwater as the apotheosis of, of their views. And, and Barry Goldwater was right about some very important things. Uh, he, was, he was right about the value of individual liberty, the Constitution. Uh, that movement successfully defeated the Soviet Union when Reagan took office. But there was one really, really important thing that Barry Goldwater got wrong. And that was his opposition to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. George Will, one of those members of the conservative movement, used to write for National Review, said, Barry Goldwater lost 44 states to LBJ. He won six states in the Deep South and Arizona. But he won the future because Reagan became president and defeated the Soviet Union. But in a certain important way, the conservative movement built by Barry Goldwater lost the future. Yes, it defeated the Soviet Union. But as you can see in this chart, the African-American vote used to be a majority Republican vote. 
up until 1932, because of course Lincoln freed the slaves. Then after the New Deal, that percentage went down into the 30s. But then after Barry Goldwater ran against the Civil Rights Act, it went down to 6% and has never really recovered. Uh, it went down uh, to 4%, a record low when uh, President Obama, then Senator Obama ran and has recovered back to pre-Obama level since. But basically that change, that realignment that took place in 1964 when uh, the, those who were opposed to the Civil Rights of, uh, Act of 1964 became Republicans over time, really changed the nature of both the Democratic and Republican coalitions. And that has ultimately affected uh, the GOP's share of other minority votes. In 2004, George W. Bush won 44% of the Hispanic vote, 44% of the Asian vote. In fact, his dad won the Asian vote. But in recent years, it's been more like 30%. And again, Trump's done a little better actually uh, than Mitt Romney did in the 2012, which is worth noting, but still a pretty poor showing at a time when uh, the demographics of this country are getting more diverse. And this leads to the challenge with the three-legged stool of the American conservative movement that Bill Buckley and others built in the 1950s. Famously, that three-legged stool was libertarians, people who really believed in individual liberty, social conservatives, and the Cold Wars who really wanted to defeat the Soviet Union. After 1964, it became more about Southern Democrats and as well as social conservatives. And we should note that there are lots of people who are social conservative who are non-white, but they didn't vote Republican or they didn't identify as conservatives in terms of the American political movement. They identified often with Democrats. And now in the Trump era, of course, we, don't, we no longer have a Cold War, at least not with the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, a lot of what we talk about in terms of cultural conservatism has revolved around immigration. We still have the libertarians who, of course, have a, uh, a complicated relationship with the current president. So what does all this mean for the future? Okay, Trump is gone, but Republicans have done reasonably well in the 2020 election. They've retained the Senate, they've retained state legislatures. So you might argue, well, everything's fine. Status quo, let's, uh, if you're a Republican, keep the Trump coalition together. Just don't tweet in, as incivilly or as, as, as uh, brusquely as Trump did and basically gentrify the Trump coalition and make it, make it uh, more attractive uh, to everyone. That's gonna be really hard. As we get into 2024 and 2028 and 2032 and 20, uh, excuse me, 2032 and 2036, that should say 2036 on the bottom, Generation Z and millennials are gonna be a majority of the electorate. And those generations, however their views evolve over time are simply not going to identify with Trump type of politics. It's a, they're more diverse generations. They're more accepting of the fact that America is a racially and ethnically diverse country. They're less religious in general than older American adults. If you look at the 18 to 29 age group, uh, a, very, a relatively smaller number are evangelical Protestants, a much larger number identify as none, having no real religious affiliation at all. So in that environment where younger voters who really don't relate to the nostalgia for the 1950s, younger voters who, aren't, uh, who don't identify with evangelical Protestantism or even mainline religious uh, affiliations, what does the electorate look like? Uh, the Center for American Progress recently tried to project if you take current demographic trends, and even if you assume that Gen Z becomes more conservative as they get older and they, they marry and have kids and own houses, that the electoral college will swing heavily blue uh, over time in the next 12 to, to 16 years. Now, again, there's imprecision in these kinds of projections, things can change, demography is not a straight line, but if Democrat, Democrats consistently are getting 400 electoral votes in the presidential race, it's not gonna be the new Democrat wing of the Democratic Party that's gonna set policy. It's going to be more the progressive side of, uh, of the Democratic Party. And for people who want free markets, that may not be so great. Now you could say the same on the other side for Republicans, but in this scenario, that's the threat to liberalism. So what is the solution? I'm gonna argue that the solution is to reclaim the world word liberalism for what we used to call classical liberals or philosophical liberals, an emphasis on personal liberty, toleration, as, as David mentioned, scientific inquiry, free enterprise, legal equality, 
and equal opportunity. Now, this is different from libertarianism. Uh, and I want to emphasize particularly these last couple of, uh, you know, these, these pictures you're seeing up here. The top one is Friedrich Hayek. The one on the right is Frederick Douglass. And the one on the bottom is John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill is, is well known as, as a classical liberal, but the 19th century liberals were a little different than the 18th century liberals. A guy like John Stuart Mill, for example, was an advocate of public education, which was actually a somewhat uh, radical or progressive view at the time because he saw public education as a guarantor uh, or a, a builder of equal opportunity. And he felt that uh, absolutism on individual liberty was not necessarily the right way to go, that actually uh, spending money, taxing people to fund public schools was good because that led to equal opportunity. Friedrich Hayek supports, supported universal coverage because he said that the hazards of life are not something that the market can naturally insure against. And of course, Frederick Douglass talked a lot about legal equality. And the reason I bring that up is that the 18th century liberals for all their virtues uh, did not spend as much time uh, or, or at least we're not as completely unified on the question of racial equality as the 19th century liberals uh, became. So what would this coalition look like if the conservative movement was a three-legged stool? What am I talking about here? I'm talking about something that would involve pro-market Democrats, what, what, in the, what in the Bill Clinton 1990 time was called the new Democrats, uh, the, 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 the people who believe in that non-censorious, pro-liberty, pro-free speech culture, uh, libertarians, of course, suburban moderates, the people who basically go about their lives, work at companies, want, the, want their world to be, to, to be reasonably uh, uh, conventional, uh, but aren't necessarily trying to tell everyone else how to live. And the kitchen table voters, the, the people who are middle class and, and lower working poor, people who basically for whom economic opportunity really matters, cost of living really matters, the rising cost of healthcare really matters, uh, the rise of monopoly power that, that increases their costs and reduces their opportunities really matters. So that's the part I would argue of the Trump coalition that I'd want to bring in here and say, look, we have to talk about equal opportunity. We have to be willing to use some tools of government to achieve results for the kitchen table voters. And this gets to the point, like, you know, you hear a lot of people say, well, there's no point in having a liberal movement in the classical liberal sense, because there's no constituency for it. Just look at the results as of uh, this afternoon, Joe Jorgensen, the Libertarian Party candidate got 1.1% of the vote. Is there really a constituency for this uh, pluralistic free market, free enterprise approach to politics? So let me make sure that I'm distinguishing here between what I'm describing as 19th century liberalism and some of these other uh, parts of our, our, our political landscape today. Compared to libertarians, uh, a key couple of elements here is that you know, in, in America, libertarians are like, you know, there's no federal role for the government at all in trying to ensure that every American has health insurance. And what I would argue as John Stuart Mill style liberalism, in fact, we should try to make sure that every more American has affordable health insurance. Uh, libertari libertarians are of mixed views about monopolies. So you know what, if we're actually going using the antitrust powers of the government to break up monopolies, that's government intervention. Uh, and I would argue that liberals should actually be pro-competition, pro-markets. And being pro-competition and pro-markets means using that antitrust power where necessary to limit the power of big businesses and monopolies. Compared to New Democrats, I'd say there's a lot of overlap but this liberal movement that I'm, I'm hoping to, to build will center in a little bit more of a market-oriented direction than, uh, than new Democrats who might be for things like the public option, uh, who, who might be comfort, more comfortable with big business, at least if you look at historical patterns of where new Democrats have ended up, uh, and perhaps more anti-deficit maybe in David Frum's, uh, uh, to David Frum's pleasure than, than purely looking at trying to limit uh, the growth in taxes. And then in terms of the Republicans, uh, where are their differences? Uh, in particular, it's, it's on recognizing that it's really important for a majority party in 2020 America to not merely uh, believe that America is a Christian country. That's important. It's very important to recognize the right of Christians to worship the way they want to, to raise their children and with the values that they want to imbue with their children. Our children, I'm a Christian too. Uh, but it's also important to, to recognize that lots of other people are not Christian, or not evangelical, not, you know, they're Catholics or they're, or they're non-Christian, and they are important partners in the American project, and they deserve that, that same level of membership and dignity in a political movement that recognizes their value. 
And I would also mention here uh, criminal justice reform. Criminal justice reform is something that libertarians uh, have, uh, have become uh, leaders in, but the Republican Party is sort of divided on criminal justice reform. They're, they're, this is one area where uh, the, maybe the Trump conservatives are particularly uh, skeptical of the value of criminal justice reform. But it's an area we really, we really, I think the liberal movement that I'm talking about really needs to recognize that the legacy of slavery and segregation still has ripple effects on the state status of African Americans in America today. And we do need to take proactive steps to recognize how all sorts of elements of our society are affected by the legacy of, of, of racial bias and segregation. Now with that, uh, let me stop and, and I, will, I will pose this question to start off the panel, which is, uh, what I'm describing, I, I, I've been careful not to mention uh, what party this coalition should be in. If it, it, maybe it's not one party, maybe it's both. Um, maybe it's totally unrealistic. And, and if, if you all think that I'm being totally crazy and this is a pipe dream, I, I want you to say that. Don't feel like you have to be polite and, and, and tell me that, that I'm not, uh, that I'm not I'm being unrealistic or no, that I'm not being unrealistic. So, but where is this? Is this realistic? Is this possible, or is this impossible? Is it possible to have whether it's in one party or, as Steve tells us, argued in this national affairs essay I mentioned earlier, is it possible that maybe it's a it's a liberal faction in both parties that works to together across party lines uh, in a in a way that's analogous to the way conservative Democrats and Republicans work together in the 20th century. So uh, maybe I'll start with you, Rich. You are the, the, uh, the guy who has thought a lot about these issues. You, you've written a, a biography of Lincoln. You've written a book recently in defense of nationalism. Uh, tell me where you come down on all this stuff. Well, first of all, Ovik, thanks so much for this event and let me be part of it. I was just so blown away by the work of Free Op, And I don't know whether you have donors on this call, but I would just urge them to keep supporting your work. It's so important, it's valuable to me. Uh, Ovik, you know I call you every couple of weeks uh, whenever I'm writing something to, to get up on COVID or to get up you know, on the, the opening schools debate. So uh, you guys really do important stuff. Uh, Thank you. I do think this is a little bit of a pipe dream though. I'm gonna say it politely, but uh, I, I, I think most of what you want should be pursued, uh, has to most plausibly be pursued within the Republican party. And uh, you might not like Trump, you might not like the current uh, iteration of the party, but uh, I think a, a market-oriented um, politics really has no other uh, home. And the fact is social conservatives and economic conservatives tend to go together. I was listening to Tommy Tuberville, the newly elected senator from Alabama uh, today on, on TV, and I'm sure that his cultural politics uh, probably make you uncomfortable, but there's no way that guy is ever voting for a tax increase, just never. And he'll be anti-regulation. Uh, and um, if you subtract Trump and his personal foibles and uh, his uh, a-constitutional view of our, our government and general ignorance, I would take the policy mix that we've had the last four years. We care, um, we care about due process and rights. Well, who, what, what administration vindicated those rights on college campus? It was the Trump administration, right? With Betsy DeVos rolling back uh, what Obama had done on Title IX, which was a gross violation of the accused. Um, criminal justice reform. You know, a, a lot of the Trump coalition wasn't particularly jazzed on that issue, but uh, Donald Trump did it. Um, historic tax reform. You know, something that conservative economists have been wanting for 30 or 40 years. Uh, Ex extreme deregulatory approach almost across the board on the economy. You can argue about how well thought out a lot of this stuff was and whether it will stick uh, if, if and when Joe Biden becomes president. But uh, to me, most of what, what you want should be, um, can be pursued within the conservative coalition and their tensions and differences on issues. You know, the party has changed on trade, as, as David Frum correctly uh, pointed out at the outset, well, let's let's have that fight. Let's let's push back uh, on that. But I, I think the idea that um, th there's some centrist uh, faction that can um, ha have significant political and policy impact outside of you know some individual issues, 
I just don't see as, as a realistic uh, possibility. Yasha, what about you? How do you think about this coming at it from someone who's, uh, who I would think of as, as, uh, as more in a democratic ecosystem versus a Republican one? Well, I certainly disagree with Rich in his assessment of a Republican party and of a Trump presidency, but thankfully it looks like we're not gonna to have to relitigate uh, Mr. Trump again in American politics a few hours hence, so I'll let that pass. Um, uh, I, I do somewhat agree with him in his view on how it is that we should fight for these liberal ideas. And I just wanna make a couple of points on that. I mean, the first is, but I think we need to distinguish between the sort of foundational principles of liberalism that you know, we should try to gain maximal consensus about in the American polity. And where I think one of the hallmarks of the last years and the reasons why I consider the Trump presidency a real test for American democracy is that those things have been called in doubt. Um, those have been called in doubt very clearly by Donald Trump. They've also been called in doubt by parts of the Democratic Party. And there were some ideas in the sort of, uh, you know, ascendant uh, progressive coalition of what we're gonna do once they, you know, win a huge landslide and control 60 senators miraculously or abolish the filibuster, uh, which have all gone out of the way in the last couple of uh, days as well. And I think that's uh, not entirely a bad thing. Um, uh, but, but the most important thing I think is that we get back to actually agreeing on respecting independent institutions, on uh, debating what the implications of expert medical advice is but taking that medical advice in so far as it is in fact scientific for granted. Um, uh, trying to unite this country and uh, get people to see what we have in common across racial and ethnic lines, rather than, and there's people on both sides who are guilty of this, um, uh, trying to maximally uh, divide the country along ethnic and racial lines and make people look down on each other, make people fear each other and make people hate each other. If we are to live in a decent society and if we are to live in a consolidated democracy, we need to ensure that this is shared by as many people as possible and that this in particular is shared by as many political actors as possible. So given that we are realistically going to remain a two party system, this means that there has to be a philosophically liberal faction in the thinnest sense that wins and prevails in both the Democratic and in the Republican Party. Now, I'm actually reasonably optimistic about that. I think it's far from clear that Donald Trump will continue to control the Republican Party. We won't really know until the 2024 primaries. Uh, it could go any number of ways. A lot will depend on personality and happenstance. Um, but I could imagine uh, the next leader of the Republican Party being one who's much more respectful of those uh, thin liberal ideas um, uh, than, than, than Donald Trump. And I actually think that there's very good reason to think that the Democratic Party uh, is going in that direction as well, not only because uh, the 46th president of the United States will likely be called Joe Biden, and neither Donald Trump nor for that matter Bernie Sanders, um, uh, and because even in the most extreme uh, leftist progressive uh, strongholds in the country, um, we are ultimately seeing a rejection of the craziest wing of the Democratic Party. This is a very small race, but I was quite interested to see that Yana Rone, um, the truly batshit uh, candidate for the mayoralty of Portland, ultimately lost to Ted Wheeler, who for obvious reasons was a pretty weakened um, incumbent. Um, then there's a question of a sort of more substantive uh, uh, liberal program. Um, now, I disagree with you on a couple of your policy preferences. I agree on a good number of them. Um, on that, I think, uh, you know, yes, there can be an intellectual, a political liberal movement that can hopefully have influence in the moderate wings of both the Democratic and the Republican Party. Uh, we have to figure out the institutional landscape for that. We have to push for those ideas. But I think it's really important to distinguish that from the thinner liberalism, because there's no problem in a polity when there's some people who are really pro-free trade and other people who are against free trade. Great, that's what democracy is for. Let's argue it out. We'll sometimes get things wrong. The consequences of that might sometimes be tragic. I'm not worried about that but we shouldn't be having debates about um, you know, the basic functioning of our democratic system or the basic tolerance we should have um, for our fellow citizens. So that's why I would distinguish between those two things. The other thing that I just want to say briefly is that you know, I think a point where you're absolutely right is about the need for the Republican party, and I'm not speaking for the Republican party since I'm a Democrat, but the need for the Republican party to try and capture a much more ethnically diverse coalition. I think 
two, two, two fronts on this. First, the idea of a rising demographic majority is the most dangerous idea in American politics. And it's also the craziest idea that large numbers of the left and right both believe in. There's lots of crazy ideas that a lot of members of the left believe in, lots of crazy ideas that a lot of members of the right believe in. There's not many crazy and uh, completely unfounded ideas that a lot of people on both the left and the right believe in. I think that's number one. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's not likely to happen. We are, and I think the one good piece of news from this election uh, is that Joe Biden has made a lot of inroads among white voters, gained a lot of support there, and Donald Trump has gained a lot of support uh, among people of color, among non-white voters. I think that's a good thing for American democracy. I do not want to live in a country where 20 years from now I can still walk down the street and guess pretty well by looking at somebody's skin color who they just voted for. That is not somewhere where we should want to go. And the idea of it has both driven people like Michael Anton on the right uh, to their kind of doomsday-ish uh, extremism. And frankly, people on the left to think we don't have any trade-offs. We can go as extreme as we want and you know, victory will fall into our lap. This election is a really good proof that that's not true. Now, the hard thing is that I think for a long time, the debate about this on the right side of politics has been aligned where basically the good moderate liberal conservatives have said, we need to moderate what we do in order to capture these kinds of voters. Um, and then we'll you know, build up this, this multi-ethnic coalition. Um, and basically the more extreme elements have said, no, we're not gonna win these people anyway. We gotta just mobilize the white coalition and F everybody else. They're just in the words of Michael Anton, you know, third world foreigners who are never gonna have any respect for the American Republic anyway, right? Um, well, what's weird is that Donald Trump has actually won the highest share of these groups. And I think there's some serious analysis that will have to go into understanding why that is. And I think part of this is just underlying trends. Part of this is just that as these uh, groups of the population are coming to become more affluent, feel more confident in their belonging in this country, um, uh, more, 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 more self-confident, they are slowly becoming more Republican as Irish Americans and Italian Americans did in the past. But part of it may be that actually Donald Trump's brand of populism did appeal to them much more than we thought. And that there's elements of that the Republican party will have to embrace in order to build that multi-ethnic coalition. I hope that they can do that in a way that doesn't give up on the thin liberalism, on the smaller liberalism, which is so important to me. But I think there's a very important and complicated question there and we may not like the, the, empirical, the answer to this empirical question from the perspective of philosophical liberals. Rich, before I go to Steve, uh, I, or I, want, I, I want you to jump in because you, you looked like you were champing at the bit there to, to, to respond. Yeah, to no, you, I, I, agree with, I agree with a lot, of, a lot of what you said and all was very thoughtful. Um, just at, at, at the end, I, I thought I was going to strenuously object to what you're saying, but then you came around to a point I agree with. I think the, the irony is a, a, a Trumpian working class, populist, more working class oriented politics has more appeal, potential appeal across racial lines than a stereotypical Mitt Romney Republicanism. And the, the perhaps the most single most impressive Trump reelection operation was devoted to winning over Latino voters in Florida. They worked it for years. So just the idea, you know, you might be a closer reader of Mike Anton than, than I am, you probably are. Um, but th there's just the the um, Trump wing of the party wants to be uh, cross racial, despite you know the horribly uh, divisive and offensive things that the president says so often. So 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 they really work this, and and I think, you know, I just take take it for granted the Republican Party is going to be more populist, given that these working class voters aren't going away, and what uh, those of us who are uncomfortable with aspects of of it uh, have to do is work to amend it and make it more. Um, constructive. And just to put a, a finer point on what I was trying to say uh, at the outset of my remarks about how it kind of take the policy mix of what we've gotten in the Trump era, if you subtract, subtract Trump from it, another way to look at it is if Tom Cotton were president the last four years, he, he considers himself a kind of Trumpist and thinks this is the future of the party that he's going to try to build on it, pre presumably at a presidential bid in 2024. More anti-tech than I am, uh, more anti-trade than I am, but 80% of it I would take, and it's not on offer in the Democratic Party or, or anywhere else. Uh, Steve, before you go, uh, I just want to say for the, the audience, if you want to ask questions, we want to be as interactive as possible. 
You can tweet your questions at hashtag agenda 2025, or you could go into the Q&A box in Zoom and, and ask your question there. Steve, your thoughts. Yep, you're on mute. Yep, it's on mute. So the way I think about this is that we're used to, and I make this argument in the national affairs piece with Rob Saldine, that we're used to thinking about these parties as homogenous units that have an ideology, right? So the Republican Party will be a Trumpist party or it won't, or the Democratic Party will be a sort of, you know, woke liberal party or it won't, right? Um, but that you know, one thing to remember, right, we're a huge continental republic um, that uh, for institutional reasons can only have two parties. Um, and it's very hard. And again, historically, it's unprecedented, really, to have long periods of time where either of these parties is homogenous, right? The traditional American pattern is to have parties that are characterized by internal he organized heterogeneity, right? That is, each of them having very large organized blocks and the politics of the parties are a function of the negotiation, you know, hashing it out, um, sort of frenemy politics that parties have, right? Where they have the, a common interest in being elected, but they're internally always at each other's throats about exactly what the direction of the party is in the party. And this is why, you know, traditionally parties would actually have you know presidents from one faction and it would nominate a, a vice president for the other because of you know that's how they literally put together the party ticket at conventions is through that kind of negotiation and i argue we argue that the future is faction um because that's what these parties are going to look like right and so that's what i guess maybe one slight adjustment i would have with Rich is, um, I do think that the Republican Party is going to be, depending on how you want, you want to call it, Trumpist, populist, nationalist, whatever, that's going to be the majority faction, right? But that faction will not be able to ever get a majority on its own, right? It's always going to, um, to need a faction that's going to have a very different sociological basis. It's going to have a different ideological basis. Um, some of the allies for the populist nationalist faction will be in the democratic party right where it's con you know, where trade is con is concerned on some of the issues with tech those people are going to want to make coalitions in some cases with the most left part of the democratic party and i think that leads you to a very different way that politics is actually going to work right increasingly you're not going to have the foundation for very strong leadership right because very strong leadership only exists as Yasha knows as a political scientist, right, where when you have high levels of internal party homogeneity and the members are willing to transfer power over to strong leaders. So I think we're, in, we're heading to a period of much more internally organized heterogeneity uh, with weaker party leaders, with more desire on an issue by issue basis to make strange bedfellows coalitions that in many cases will cut across party lines, right? So what does that mean? For liberalism. Well, one, I think one thing we haven't talked about, right, is a very important part of American liberalism is a belief in Madisonianism, right, a belief in um, separation of powers, a belief in deliberation. And so recently, over the last 20, 30 years, we've had a condition of parliamentary parties without parliamentary institutions, right? We've had these highly homogenous parties that actually aren't able to govern in a parliamentary fashion. And that's one of the reasons why we've had such recurrent patterns of disappointment because the parties oh, you know, go through electioneering as if they're gonna be able to enact their uh, agenda and, they, and then they can't, right? Well, part of liberalism, again, is a belief in deliberation, right? It's a belief that our Madisonian system is designed to put together lots of different coalitions. And one of the things that actually prevents some of the tribalism that I think Ovik is especially worried about is the fact that our legislature, for the most part, only produces legislation out of one particular party coalition over and over again, right? Where one of the things that actually makes constitutionalism works, right, is that on any one issue, you can have different coalitions um, and that members are going to realize that they're going to need each other, even if they're opposed on this issue, the issue, they may need each other on the next. And that that creates a, I think, a foundation for um, what Rich might call nationalism, what I might call patriotism, right? Part of that is, a, is not just a belief in airy 
ideas, but a sense that we need each other, right? That we actually have projects that we want to engage in that we're, if, even if we're opposed on this thing, we might be um, uh, on, agreed on the other, right? The only thing, again, if I was to poke holes in Ovik's um, argument, he invited me here, so I, I presume I'm not here to poke holes in his argument. Oh, you can um, poke holes all you want. <laughs> Liberalism, and again, this is something Yasha is more of an expert on, uh, on than I. Um, liberalism is and always will be a minority preference, right? And that's for a couple of reasons. Um, one, um, I think the sociological basis for liberalism is relative, is historically relatively narrow. Um, uh, that is, it's a, it is a bourgeois belief, right? There are elements of liberalism that have a larger sort of coalition than that, right? But full spectrum liberalism, uh, and my vision of what full spectrum liberalism is and OVIX is a little different, but I don't think they're radic they come out of the same underlying tree, right? Um, that has a particular often bourgeois um, class and other sociological foundation. Um, it also is the fact that uh, one of the problems with actually describing either party as composed of these ideological categories is most Americans actually have relatively weak commitment or understanding of ideological categories. And this is something we know from lots of behavioral research, right? So if we think of it as that way, right? I think of liberalism in both parties as a pivotal, but probably not um, majority part of either one of those factions, right? So again, the, what I call the market liberal faction of the Democratic Party has a particular basis in some of the things that Ovik was describing um, in sort of, you know, in terms of its patronage, right, it's more likely to be tech, the patronage of the liberal conservatives in the Republican Party is more likely to be finance, liberal conservatives are likely to be a little less um, enthusiastic about cultural experimentation than market liberals are going to be, um, and they're going to want to make coalitions with each other across party lines, and because they're going to be pivotal, but minority, right, what they're going to want from the rest of their party, what they're going to ask for in the rest of their party is to say, look, you know, we'll support you being in charge, you know, organizing Congress, whatever it is, right? But what you have to give us is relatively weak governance, right? Relatively weak party control so that we can make these coalitions apart and cross party lines. And that's where I think the future of both liberal institutions outside of government, like FreeOp, like the Niskanen Center, and since we're advertising, you should also give money to the Niskanen Center. Um, uh, there's a thing on the website. Um, that is, all of these are likely to work across party lines. They're often likely to be, succeed because they can find and piece together some of these coalitions with the other parts of the party that are actually less intellectually dynamic, are less professional, have less of a foundation and expertise, right? The power of liberalism is gonna come less through numbers. In many cases, it's gonna come through ideas and the ability to act as a sort of policy entrepreneur to pull together other parts of this party coalition together. And the final thing I'll just say is one point. Um, a, I think the discussion about how great Republicans did with minorities is a little bit of talk in your own book. I think you can massively overstate that with the exception of Cubans and Venezuelans who have a very particular, there's a very particular story there. I think a lot of that is there are people, especially in the Republican party who want the Republican party to pay more attention to trying to attract these voters. And they're trying to you know, make it seem like Trump did great and we should just keep doing more of that. I think that's a that, that, that's a very wholesome instinct that's probably out ahead of the data. Um, but again, it's a wholesome instinct and it's a wholesome instinct because part of liberal, what I would call liberal politics is a politics in which the parties are constantly trying to poach each other's coalition. They're constantly trying to sort of make forays across enemy lines, right? So that we don't think about politics as trench warfare where everybody knows exactly who's on either side and all the politics is just about who can sort of mass more power. And that's where I agree with Yasha about the sort of demographic destiny part of this, right? One thing is each party should be constantly, you know, both for its own party health, but also for the health of the system to be constantly trying to make forays into the other side. This is why Democrats need to constantly be, you know, campaigning to voters of faith of various different kinds, right? To be trying to actually figure out how to make their ideas appealing and in some cases to adjust their ideas for those voters 
both for the sake of their party's own um, interests, but also for the sake of the overall system, right? And that instability and fluidity that actually allows us again to think of ourselves as a nation and as a country, as opposed to a set of sort of warring, um, warring parties. All right, let me stop you there. We, uh, questions are pouring in. So this, this one's for Rich. Um, you know, we, we've talked and Steve talked about and Yasha talked about the, uh, the fact that there are what we might call a small L liberal moderate factions in both parties. You know, the Democratic Party right now seems to be doing that better, right? They're, the Biden types are, are recognized as full-fledged card-carrying members of the Democratic Party, even if the AOCs of the world are annoyed with, with Biden's quote-unquote corporatism. We used to have that in the Republican Party. Reagan nominated George H.W. Bush, uh, a moderate. George H.W. Bush uh, had his, his vice president, Dan Quayle. You know, we used to have that kind of thing in the Republican Party too, but in recent years, it hasn't been like that. It's been more both candidates, the top of the ticket and the, uh, the, you know, the VP have to be uh, true blue conservatives. The Charlie Bakers of the world, these, these uh, Republicans from more blue states have not been, basically not have been able to have national ambitions because they've been seen as, uh, you know, un too, too liberal, too moderate, too, uh, you know, not conservative enough to be acceptable to the Republican coalition. So what, what happened there? And is that something that's uh, restorable where the, the, uh, the small L liberal wing of the Republican party has that level of dignity where they're seen as an, as an equal partner? Yeah, so a, a couple of points. I'll answer the question in the course of answering it, um, address, not really disagree, just underline or comment on, on a few uh, things Steve said. So uh, as he mentioned in his piece, there is a role for these kind of moderates still in the party, but it's mostly at the, sorry, I didn't silence my phone. It's mostly at the, the state and local level. You know, it's a Charlie a Baker or a, a Governor Hogan. It, it, it is just that the, the cultural element of the Republican coalition is the strongest. Uh, that's something we learned in the 2016 primaries. Donald Trump could run jettisoning entitlement reform, saying it's terrible, saying he's going to, you know, import free drugs and screw the pharmaceutical companies. All that was acceptable, it turns out. Saying that Do uh, George W. Bush lied us into war, that was acceptable, it turned out. But there was no way he could have won the nomination if he'd been pro-choice or pro-gun control. And I, I don't know how he realized that, whether he, whether he intuited it or someone told him and he believed it, but that's just... Uh, a fact. So it limits the national ambitions of politicians who are moderate on those particular issues. But uh, one further thought on this, you know, a kind of moderate, especially in 2016, was Donald Trump, right? This, he was culturally conservative, but no one was going to make mistake him for a theocrat. No one thought he was anti-gay. No one thought he wanted to you know, run down trans people and chase them out of bathrooms. He just didn't plausibly care about any of that stuff. Um, and he was uh, more moderate on, on economic issues. And in terms of factions with the, within the Republican Party, I, I think the last four years basically we've had a shotgun marriage between um, a Donald Trump party and uh, a kind of Paul Ryan or Mitch McConnell party. And the fact that it is a shotgun marriage is obscured by um, ju just the kind of the lickspittle unwillingness to criticize uh, stupid things and offensive things and divisive things that Donald Trump says. But there, there's no doubt that this, this is a coalition. And to, to Steve's point, he was making the, um, the argument that a populist party isn't enough, a Trumpist party isn't enough. I think that's true. And if you look at 2016, it was very interesting. Both Pat Toomey, a representative of the kind of the Paul Ryan uh, wing of the, of the Republican Party, and Donald Trump both won Pennsylvania, but they won it in different ways. And um, what, what we learned th this time around is that the, the Trump way, you can almost get there, you know, and he did get there in 2016 with the, with the, the help of Hillary Clinton. But that path is just too narrow. It's too narrow even for Donald Trump, it looks like, to repeat his trick from 2016. It's certainly too narrow for anyone else to try. So the challenge for the party is going to be to keep those working class voters, or almost all of them, and be less radioactive and less offensive in the suburbs. Question for you, Yasha, uh, from the audience. Uh, what about constitutional or structural changes that could uh, improve uh, de democratic institutions? Uh, things like uh, having uh, limited terms for the Supreme Court or a, a Nebraska style or Maine style system for the electoral college, ranked choice voting, I think is something you've uh, written about. W what do you think about some of these reforms and, and which ones would be important 
or are they all pipe dreams? I mean, wh what should we think about structural reform? How necessary? Um, well, I think it's quite clear that we're pipe dreams for the next two or four years. Um, so, so that's interesting. Um, uh, look, I, I, I go different ways in different ones of them. I think that there are certain elements of our political system which have grown in relatively random ways over time um, and are reasonably irrational and there can be real improvements and fixes. I think there's others that are currently being attacked which are foundational aspects of how the United States works and the idea that we're ever going to change or get rid of them is uh, some mixture between dangerous and a pipe dream. So, uh, you know, look, starting with... Um, uh, single transfer of a vote. Um, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. It's actually a good way of keeping out uh, more extreme candidates or at least candidates who are sort of loved or hated by a majority of the population, um, uh, you know, might create a little bit more competition for the two party system, not too much. Uh, I think it, it'll survive it actually, but um, but might put some pressure on the parties in helpful ways. Um, you know, that can be adopted case by case at whichever level the election is taking place, local, state, um, perfectly in favor of that, no problems with it personally. Electoral college, um, I don't think that electoral college is a deep constitutive element of the United States. Um, there's not going to be a constitutional amendment to change it. I think that's unlikely and unrealistic. Um, we might get the national vote compact, uh, whether the Supreme Court is going to accept it or not is a big question. Um, but there could be this way around needing a constitutional change um, in order to basically go to a popular vote system. I'd vote in favor of that. I'm not strongly committed to it. Um, I think once it comes to Supreme Court reform, it becomes more complicated. I am very opposed to packing the court. Um, I think uh, on, on substantive grounds, I think that would have been a disaster. I also think it's a hilarious strategic mistake that all of the sort of progressive media and by progressive media now include things like the New York Times, um, you know, has spent weeks cheering that on and the expectation of a landslide victory that would actually make that possible. And of course, it turns out that that's not going to be a realistic possibility at all anyway. Um, so wonderful job, you know, provoking people into fearing the kind of radicalism of the Joe Biden administration, which would never have been radical anyway, um, uh, uh, just in order to end up in a situation where you can't do it in the first place. Um, uh, when it comes to some of those more time-limited things, um, I, I think... I. I I'm very torn for the following reason, which is I think it would make sense to have 18 year terms or 15 year terms, whatever it is for, for judges and to know basically that one presidential term buys you whatever it is, you know, two, just, two, two nominations to the Supreme Court. It doesn't depend on the happenstance of who dies at random intervals, right? I mean, all of that I think would rationalize our political system. And if control of the Supreme Court was currently really unclear, if there was four conservatives and four liberals and a swing voice, then perhaps we might have a grand bargain where everybody can somehow rally around that. Of course, there is a hypocritical element here, which is that when I came to the United States, you know, every grad school seminar that I sat in with Ronnie Dworkin and you know, some of the greats of legal jurisprudence said, you know, the Supreme Court is an incredibly pro-democratic thing and having activist judges is a wonderful thing for democracy uh, and we should never change anything about the system. And now suddenly where conservatives have uh, won a majority for some legitimate and some illegitimate ways on the Supreme Court, uh, the conventional wisdom has completely flipped around and suddenly it's obvious that if you're on the left, you should think of the Supreme Court as a deeply problematic institution and we all want to reform it. Well, of course, you know, we partially want to reform it because we don't currently hold power on it. And Republicans understandably are gonna say, why, do we, why should we give away this power? So, I think actually on, on, on principled grounds, I favor some of these reforms, but they're not politically neutral in a context where one side holds the power. And so that's why I think they're not going to happen. And even for the right, like I do actually believe that they would make sense. There's a hypocritical nature to what people on my side and that are saying, and we should be sort of um, honest and upfront about it. Last point, very briefly, the idea that the Senate is deeply undemocratic and that we should change the basic con constitution of the Senate um, I, I think it's just unrealistic. It is both uh, factually wrong um, and I think just a complete misreading of um, how power can ever work in a federal republic that for good reason gives a lot of power to states and a lot of representation to states. Um, you know, make Puerto Rico a state, sure, absolutely in favor. Give representation to DC, of course, I think that's perfectly appropriate if you can get the numbers to make it happen. But you know, problematize the very idea of having two senators per state there you're really starting to attack the basic 
uh, foundational bargain, uh, not just of the United States, but realistically of any large scale federal republic. And the fact that that's gotten a lot of oxygen um, in my circles, I think is um, testament to sloppy thinking. I'm beginning to feel warmer and warmer towards the liberals. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I'm gonna make just one really quick point on this. So Qu really like, quickly, because we've got a lot of questions to get I to. I am really, really quick. So I'm gonna be a lot quicker than Yasha was. So uh, I also think 18 year terms are great. I think Rich should think 18 year term, your terms are great. Um, they actually, are, I think are consistent with our underlying Madisonian constitutional system. All the other ones um, stink in my view. Um, and partially it's because I think they come out of the entirely the wrong instinct, right? Which is that somehow moderates or those who are between the sort of extremists of both parties should be able to find some way to get power without actually earning it through organizing, right? And so they're always looking, these kind of people who are in favor of ranked choice voting or single train, all this, right, are looking for some shortcut to actually doing the work of democracy, of actually going out and finding constituents to organizing them, to getting them involved in politics. And that is the single most important vice of people who think of themselves in the center, right? Is they, unlike these other groups, right? Whatever you think of the DSA, whatever you think about um, uh, people on the right, right? They went out and found people and organized them and connected them to each other horizontally. Um, and that's the kind of work that people like, I think liberals historically have never been good at. Um, liberals, as we're understanding on this call, have never been good at and need to develop the habits of politics and democratic politics in that sense. Persuasion, makes sense. Uh, one question we got that that uh, that's kind of uh, related to what David Frum uh, talked about in the introduction, which is what's the bipartisan small L liberal approach to deficit reduction? Uh, I'll use moderators' privilege to address that, which is read our work at Free Up on healthcare reform, which is all about healthcare is really the driver of our deficit and debt in the United States. It's really about reducing. Uh, the, the rising growth of healthcare spending and, and the cost of healthcare. If you can do that and get healthcare spending un under control, you can get the debt and deficit under control as well. Um, uh, Rich, a question for you. This is something that uh, you and I have talked about uh, privately in the past or any, and even in public forums. Uh, one thing that conservatives have, have often been triggered by is uh, things like well, the Declaration of Independence was written by Thomas Jefferson, who owned slaves. Uh, conservatives don't want to have that conversation. They don't. They want to say, "Let we should just, you know, give Jefferson effectively some kind of past or past or not really argue about it." You know, Jefferson was a founder, and let's not. It, it's anti-American to call attention to to his slave ownership. It's it's anti-American to call attention to the Three Fifths Compromise or or the or the the, the that the slavery the history of slavery in the U.S. Uh, obviously, the 1619 Project, you know, uh, accelerated that debate, but that debate's been with us for a long time. Is there a way, uh, it, it seems to me there's a barrier, if conservatives want to reach out to African Americans, let alone small L liberals, you have to be able to address this point that uh, if you're if you're African American, if you're black, you're not nostalgic about 1787. Mm -hmm. um, how, how should uh, conservatives and even small liberals address that and, and talk about the founding in a way that, that addresses that, those concerns? Well, I think we should favor a truthful history. And that means there's no denying that Thomas Jefferson had slaves and had, had an affair uh, with, with a slave and had uh, some dark racial attitudes. And I think by the end, you know, if he'd lived through the Civil War, would have been a secessionist. So it's, it's a really complicated record. Now, I think those aren't the things we honor him for, and there's still incredible accomplishments that we should honor him for, but uh, we don't do ourselves any favors or students any favors or the, the nation any favors by wanting to brush that uh, under the rug. On, on the other hand, we don't want to weaponize the sins of our forebears to create a, a poisonously distorted picture of what the, the country was and, and is now. And I think that's, we, we see too much of that in the 1619 Project and, and on the other side. But having a, a deep sympathy for uh, the uh, oppression that African-Americans um, suffered, having a, a deep appreciation for the great freedom story that they represent as conservatives and liberals, we're, we're in favor of freedom, right? If, if there's there's one uh, group in American history that has fought and uh, get given up the most to earn freedom and to realize that ideal in this country, it's African-Americans. And 
even if it doesn't result in any additional votes or any support from African Americans, that's the right thing uh, to do. And it's, it's a little, you know, it's a balancing act getting buffeted by uh, the, the stiff winds of the cultural war one way or the other on this, but it's, it's entirely the, it's the right and the truthful approach. Uh, for anyone uh, uh, who wants to answer this, what about the groups that are out there like no labels, the real sort of explicitly centrist or moderate uh, groups? Have they, I, to the degree they've been successful, have they been and why have they been and, or have they not been? Let's evaluate the, the no labels, the problem solvers caucus, these more you know, kind of explicitly centrist groups. Where do they fit into all this and, and where have they succeeded or failed? So I'll say a little bit and I'm, I'm a little, hesitant. Um, I mean, I think some of these, um, uh, you know, so there's a difference between people like no labels who are out there who have a mailing list and have some members who are connected to, to each other, right? I mean, all of this, in my view, and in the view of the, of the paper that you referred to, is just insufficiently partisan, right? Um, there is no political space for moderation of any, however you define it, or liberalism or whatever you say, outside of the parties, right? And there's no place for that, except the place that they earn through actually doing, again, the work of democratic politics, actually fighting it out for control of the Connecticut and Massachusetts Republican parties or the Democratic parties of, you know, of red states, right? You know, that's where the power actually is going to be, right? And I think so much of this has been, um, A, a lot of it has been people who are uncomfortable with the dirty work of politics, right? A lot of that sort of work of taking over parties and states or counties or cities, you know, really is like dirty, grimy work. And when I, and I'm, so I'm a scholar of the conservative movement, right? And one thing, when you look at the hist history of the conservative movement, right? They did that work, right? They took over school boards in various places, right? The politics all the way down. And that for me is the great failure of all of the organizational investment that's been done in any way kind of in the center, depending on how you want to define it, is it's all insufficiently political. It's all insufficiently conflictual, right? This is often the spirit of this are people who say they want to have debate or they want to take the tenor down or they remember when people used to go out and have beers together, right? That spirit um, while it claims to be democratic, really, I think, is, is not democratic because democracy is conflict, right? And deliberation comes out of conflict and organized conflict. And so I think that is, so my problem, I think, is the underlying psychological spirit of a lot of that organization seems wrong and apolitical and also ineffectual. A question for either or both of Yasha and Rich. Uh, we have this now uh, uh, six uh, co nominally conservative justices on the Supreme Court. Uh, it's possible that that 6-3 majority, or maybe it's a 5-4 majority, but more likely a 6-3 majority, tries to revisit Roe v. Wade. One of the big dividing lines between the Democrats and Republicans has been abortion. If Roe v. Wade were overturned, hypothetically, and it went back to the states to legislate uh, abortion in a, in, a, in, a, in a legislative sense rather than a judicial sense, does that have the potential to reshape the, the nature of, of, of social conservatism and the way the parties sort today? Or will it just sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, harden the existing divisions? I don't know. I don't, I don't think it would resort the parties at all. I think you, you would end up with a democratic settlement that you would have had, you know, 40 or 50 years ago, if the court hadn't tried to impose its will on this issue, which would be more liberal than I would like as a very strong pro-lifer, but more restrictive than a lot of very pro-choice people would like with a little bit you know, of patchwork uh, in various states. So um, it, it's, it's just, it's really, I think it's impossible to exaggerate the damage uh, to, to our uh, politics that that decision did. And it, it made the court the hot button uh, had a huge role in making the court the hot button that it is uh, today. And if if you don't like the how culturally conservative the Republican Party is today, Roe is a big reason why. Because uh, pro-lifers um, mobilized, uh, they're told repeatedly, "You're going to go away. You're on the wrong side of history." They never went away, 
and they found a, a home in the Republican Party. And this goes to the issue of, of factions. You know, what, what you should seek to do as a faction, yet like cross-partisan uh, work on certain issues. But what you really want to do as a faction to have ultimate influence is take over a party. Um, you know, the, the Breitbart people were a faction and kind of a ridiculous and tiny faction and seemingly irrelevant faction. And you know, thanks to the, the oversized persona of Donald Trump and various other circumstances in 2016, they took over a party. And, and that's really the name of uh, the game. So um, I, I, I would urge my, my liberal friends that have, have that ultimate goal. Let, let's wrap up with this. Um, we, maybe Joe we, Biden, um, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's wrap up with this. Uh, for each of you, what is the thing that you believe about the next decade, 2020 to 2030, uh, when it comes to this issue of how there's you know, the factions and coalitions and movements that's that's most unconventional or most surprising to to the conventional wisdom? I'll go first. Um, I have two. One of them has become a lot more conventional over the last 48 hours, but um, I have a chapter of my next book that I wrote about that a few months ago, and I've been banging on about it for a long time, which is, but I think the American electorate is likely to depolarize by race. Uh, and I think that's, that's a very, very positive thing. Um, I'll say one other thing, which is, um, you know, when you're in the middle of a trend, it always feels like the trend is going to get worse. And I've, you know, been arguing for many years that Populism is an international movement. Um, it's a dangerous one. It sits, sits deep in our psyche. I'm much more optimistic today than many of my liberal and progressive friends because I think uh, likely having beaten Donald Trump at all is a tremendous accomplishment, which um, uh, you know uh, stands in contrast to the fate of countries uh, like Turkey, like uh, India, uh, like Hungary, like Poland, where similar, in certain ways, similar candidates did manage to win re-election. Um, so I think this is, this is there to stay and it's not going away. But um, I think people are overly pessimistic about uh, us being able to contain it within the United States and both sides of the aisle. Um, I think it's not a coincidence that Joe Biden wound up winning the primaries. Um, I think there's very interesting uh, first signs of a rejection of uh, wokeism uh, within the democratic coalition. This is completely dominant within uh, parts of the media class and the consultant class. It is not at all dominant in the democratic electorate. You can look at the outcome of some of the ballot measures in California um, uh, for confirmation to that. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, my many conservative friends who are despairing about what the future of the Republican Party will look like, um, I think are a little too pessimistic about the possibility that the nature of that party might once again change. Um, you know, the, the most important election we are awaiting once this one concludes is the 2024 primaries. And, and we really don't know who is going to wind up winning that. Um, I think it's imaginable that it's a candidate who uh, is, is more moderate, even as he probably or she probably moves in the direction of this sort of working class, um, uh, uh, in certain ways populist coalition they may wind up being quite a lot more moderate than Donald Trump, quite a lot less dangerous to American democracy. And, um, and what I certainly believe is that most Americans are sick of politics being so existential and so uh, unpleasant uh, as it is right now. And so I could imagine that five or 10 years ago, uh, our political scene feels both more moderate and a lot calmer than it does today. That's by no means the likely outcome or certainly not, not, not a certain outcome but I think there's a bigger pathway towards that uh, than most, most of us recognize right now. Right. I guess right. I would say that um, in some ways the American political system is gonna be more chaotic, right? But I mean chaotic in a good way, right? One problem with American politics, and I suggested that in a few earlier comments, is the battle lines between the parties have been too sharply and stably drawn. And that's given the idea, you know, you see this on the Democratic Party side all the time on my side where people are constantly saying, you know, there's, there's no, you know, voters in the middle, there's no persuadables, everything is all mobilization, right? It's all just that we have these like well divide, divided sort of groups, um, uh, groups in each party, sorry, COVID. Um, and uh, I think, so one thing is I think that 
the issues that we're talking about are not going to be the same issues that um, we're used to, where we've gotten in a very long slump where we keep having the same, we're like an old uh, married couple who keeps having the same fight over and over again. And I think actually we're going to be fighting about something different, right? And, and fighting about something different, about having a different agenda, about having a different set of issues that are considered to be the dominant issues, that has the potential to shake up a lot of these coalitions. And that's traditionally what shook up the co a lot of these coalitions, right? Having race out of the, um, the American party system for, very, for a number of reasons had um, the effect of having one kind of party coalition and the entry of race into a central part shook up those coalitions. And I'll just give one last example, right? Which is um, organized labor, right? I actually think the more Republicans become and define themselves as a working class party, right? And the more they become fundamentally sort of existentially concerned about the well being of the working class, the more they're going to realize that the atomization of that working class is, in fact, a large part of what produced Trumpism, right? Trumpism is what you get not just when you get a white working class, but when you get an unorganized, atomized, working class. And that's why I think it's not surprising that you see people like American Compass saying that we need some kind of form of organized labor. I think that's partially because they realize that sociologically an unorganized, atomized working class without social institutions is actually a sociologically quite dangerous thing. And that it's easier to imagine organizing them against the other parts of the party that are still likely to be dominated by business unless they actually have that degree of organization that some form of collective bargaining or unionization gives them. So that's the thing I, I would say is, uh, is gonna be the surprise over the next 10 years. Rich. So I, I could see, I'm so conventional, I'm not gonna offer unconventional ideas of my own, instead I'm gonna criticize my colleagues. So I, I actually, I can see it both, I, I think both of these are true. If, if you look at what just happened this, this election, if, if it turns out the way we think, and Biden wins and Republicans probably hold the, the majority, depending on G Georgia special elections or re r runoffs, um, the American people have said to the Democrats, OK, we agree with you. Your strongest argument was that Donald Trump shouldn't be president. So he's not going to be president. But we don't trust you with power to do anything, any of your agenda. So what we've given you is a caretaker president with bipartisan impulses from a bygone era who is going to have to work for the next two to four years with another 70 year old white guy making you know, various compromises in the Senate. Enjoy, right? So the level of drama in American politics, just going from Trump to Biden will be uh, you know, dramatically diminished, but then going to Biden not being able to do anything is gonna be even uh, further diminished. So that's where I, I agree with Yasha, maybe things are gonna be calmer than we expect, but over the long term, I, I'm with Steve. I think I think you know the disaggregation of everything will continue. This will will uh, uh, pr produce um, less consensus and more chaos across the board. That has uh, benefits. That has disadvantages. But we're definitely we're no longer in the America that ha has is so formative about the, the way we think the norm should be. That post-war uh, consensus era when you had three big broadcast networks and big industrial concerns, working with big unions to, and with big government to work things out. That is just long gone. And that was that was a parenthesis, as our friend Yuval Levin has always pointed out, in American life. This poisonous contention in our politics, that's the norm. So the, the safest prediction is over time, we'll see more of that rather than less. That's great. Well, listen, we uh, we couldn't get to all That's of our great. questions. Thank you. You're on board with that. <laughs> I, 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 I'm with you, man. I, I, I think we're going to be calmer. I think you're right. It's going to be calmer for now. And uh, but uh, but uh, there will always be contentions. There have always have been in the United States. And, and but as Yasha said, you know, can we have that consensus around the basic democratic and, and small liberal institutions? That's uh, that's certainly something we're trying to do at Free Out. We had a set of questions that I will table for tomorrow around how, what's the small L liberal bipartisan approach to equality of opportunity, addressing uh, economic inequality. Stay tuned tomorrow for our panel at the same time, 3.30 Eastern, where we're gonna have Raihan Salam, president of the Manhattan Institute and former editor at Nash Review, Scott Winship, director of the poverty uh, program at AEI, and Zachary Carabell, uh, of, of lots of places, including New America Foundation and also a, a visiting fellow at Free App, 
they're going to be uh, discussing that issue. That's again at 3.30, the same URL link that you use to log into the Zoom uh, channel today. Uh, with that, let me thank all of you. You can check uh, the schedule for this conference over the next couple of weeks at agenda.freeop.org. Rich, Yasha, Steve, and David Brum, thanks so much for sparing the time today. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you.